Thanks to um, all of our kids for helping me out on that one. But I need my glasses. I can't see today. I did the sermon last hour. I think it went pretty well, but I was guessing at a few of the words, okay? I don't think I wanted to do that. Grace and peace to each one of you this day in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is great to see all of you here. Uh, May the Spirit of God be with us in our thoughts and our words. Um, This is a great story. It is the story of what has been known as a banquet of Simon. It's actually a dinner party, I think, more than anything else. Um, And the story goes like this from the Gospel of Luke, the seventh chapter. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And so he went into the Pharisee's house, and Jesus took his place at the table. And a woman in the city who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating at the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She entered the house, stood behind Jesus at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now the Pharisee, the man who had invited Jesus to his house, saw this. He said to himself, if Jesus were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Simon replied, tell me. So Jesus told him this story. A certain creditor had two people who owed him debts. One owed him a debt of 500 denarii, a very large sum. The other owed a debt of 50 denarii, a far lesser sum. When both of these individuals could not repay the money they had borrowed, He canceled both of their debts. Now, which person do you suppose would love him more? The one whose debt represented 500 denarii or the one whose debt represented 50 denarii? Well, Simon answered Jesus, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning towards the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, Simon. And you gave me no water for my feet. But this woman has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. When I entered your house, you gave me no kiss of greeting. But from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Therefore, she has shown me great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then Jesus looked at the woman and said, your sins are forgiven. Those who were around the table with Jesus began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So, this is a rich story and a really, really important story. It's important, though, that we not get misdirected by this story. Our eyes and our imagination go right to this woman. She is the drama of the story, after all. You have to believe that she sat at home and thought about what she was going to do. Now, there's another story that's not remembered or told here, and that is the interaction between Jesus and this woman. We don't know what happened. We don't really know much about her. We don't know whether the the characterization of her as a sinner was fair or unfair. But we do know she had a reputation that Simon felt that he could easily cast upon her. And you have to know that she sat at home and thought about what she was going to do and consciously decided to do just this thing. To go into a house that she wasn't invited to, the house of a Pharisee, this religious elite who she knew was going to look down his nose at her, she came into his house uninvited and lavished gratitude and thanksgiving and love onto Jesus in the only way she knew how. With her tears, her hair, this expensive ointment, and her kisses. All of our attention go to her. Similarly with the people that were there, all their attention went right to her as well. You can imagine the discomfort. This was not socially acceptable behavior. She wasn't socially acceptable. And all the ones that were sitting around the table with Jesus were scandalized 
outraged, offended. But to Jesus, there's no scandal here with this woman at all. In fact, I think to Jesus, she's acting perfectly understandably. Something had transpired with her and him. He had already probably offered her healing, hope, restoration, welcome, dignity, respect, love. And she was simply doing the only thing that a human heart can do when given a new life, a new chance, a new hope. She expressed herself the only way her exploding heart could do. There was no scandal here for Jesus. This was a sign of the kingdom. <laughs> this is why he came. So that somebody who had to live under the scorn of all of her neighbors could find the liberation of grace. But there was a scandal in the room for Jesus. There was somebody in this story that we should have our eyes firmly fixed on, and it's Simon. It's not the woman. You see, the woman was just like the blind man that Jesus gave sight to. She was just like the lepers that Jesus had healed. She was just like the demonic man um, that was imprisoned out in the cemetery that Jesus liberated. Just like the woman who had a chronic illness all of her life. All of them are just like this woman. They came to Jesus with gratitude and thanksgiving. She is not the scandal. No act would have been too outrageous for the gift she had been given. No word of thanks would have been too little to say. Nothing could really express the joy and freedom and gratitude that burst out of her heart any more effectively than what she just did. She was not the scandal of this story. It is this simple statement pointed at Simon that's at the heart of this story for me and I think for you. In the midst of all the tittering that was going on, in the midst of all the, the, the whispered asides, in the midst of all the arched eyebrows and the scandalous kind of uh, revelation that was happening, in the midst of all of that, Jesus calmly looks at Simon as Simon is thinking to himself and saying out loud, this Jesus, if he was really a prophet, he'd never let this happen. Doesn't he know who she is? Doesn't he realize what she is doing? She was unclean, unworthy. She wasn't supposed to touch somebody like Jesus, this prophet. In the midst of those thoughts, Jesus calmly looks at Simon, looks him right in the eye and says, Simon, I've got something to tell you. I think it's the clearest sentence in all of the New Testament. Simon, I've got something to tell you. And then he tells him this story. You see, Jesus locks right onto Simon, for he, not the woman, is the object of the story. And it's Simon's transformation that makes this story important enough to have been remembered and written down and shared for you and me. It's not the woman's story, it's the story of Simon that we're supposed to pay attention to here. You see, Simon's problem is, quite frankly, our problem. Simon needed to hear from Jesus that it is not his to judge. It wasn't his to put boundaries on whom God can forgive, upon whom God thinks is worthy, who God claims is a child, who God loves or who God grace. God forgives who God chooses. And God's grace is deep and wide and all of God's precious children are the object of grace. But even that, I don't think, was Simon's real problem. Simon's problem here, and frankly, our great risk, is that Simon had lost touch with just how desperately he needed God's love and God's grace and God's forgiveness. Simon had lost the ability to look in the mirror and see himself for who he was. He had, by definition, become self-righteous. He thought that he was so righteous that he did not need forgiveness or grace in his life. That's the scandal. And that's the loss. You see, the scandal existed in Simon's heart. He did not see himself in this woman. He didn't see that he and she were the same. She was actually ahead of him. 
She had already claimed the grace and the forgiveness and the new life, and she was just acting out her gratitude. Simon was locked up back in his own self-righteousness, unable to accept the embrace that Jesus was willing to give him. And that is our risk. There's something dangerous about growing up Christian. There's something dangerous about growing up in the church. It becomes really dangerous when we lose the ability to be honest with who we are. You see, only if and only when Simon could get real about the scandal that was him, the scandal that God had claimed, forgiven, welcomed, and embraced him, when Simon could get real about that, then Simon could change and take a hold of the new life that Jesus was offering him. Once Simon realized that he and the woman were the same, everything would change. Who was in, who was out? Who was clean, who was unclean? Who was righteous, who was unrighteous? Who was a child of God? Who was his sister? All of that was about to change, but it was going to require a turning on the part of Simon, a transformation, a repentance, a rebirth. And Simon would experience that in order for him to follow Jesus out into this world. And so that's our challenge. That's where our eyes need to be focused on this story, is that we are like Simon. That our greatest danger is that we forget who we are. And we forget that we continually need the grace of God in our life as this warm embrace of love and forgiveness. The scandal of this story is that you and Simon and me and the woman are all the same. And the quicker that we accept that, the easier and better life becomes. The more aware we are of that truth, the more useful we are to Jesus in this world. If we never get over our self-righteousness, we really are of no use to God and we struggle through our own life. But when we get over ourselves, and accept ourselves as a sometimes broken, often misguided, loved, graced child of God, then we can be useful to God in this world and be useful to our neighbors. You see, once in a while, right in the midst of all the confusion of life, Jesus bends down and whispers in our ear, I've got something to tell you. And like Simon, we should listen. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.